So I feel like, and there's whole kind of systems of thought around this, that in order to um, optimize uh, rejuvenation, anti-aging, you have to understand some of the key micro minerals and the relationships to each other. And that is iron, copper, zinc, and molybdenum. So iron is well known as being, you know, the thing that prevents anemia from a medical point of view, because medical medical point of view is all looking at like what disease does it prevent. So iron on its own doesn't necessarily prevent anemia, but it's the most um, uh, you know first thing looked at and the most common cause of uh, anemia, lack of iron. Now there is also zinc. And there is also copper and there's also molybdenum. Why am I grouping all these four together? Because if you have a lot too much of any one of these, either because you're consuming a lot or even just because it's building up on your body for some reason, and we can talk about why, then it will cause a deficiency of all the others. So they're actually antagonistic to each other, all of these nutrients. If you have a massive amount of any of the four I just mentioned, compared to maybe what's normal in food, you could create a deficiency in all the rest. And that's why it's super, super important. Because lots of people take iron supplements. Um, it is one of the most common uh, minerals uh, supplements taken these days and more and more people because of the whole viral thing in the last few years have started taking high doses of zinc as well these are not bad things to do necessarily but the idea that oh in order to be healthy all i gotta do you know other than healthy lifestyles i just gotta take zinc and d3 which is what i'm hearing constantly these days maybe a magnesium added is not accurate and in fact if you take high dose zinc and high dose d3 and are not aware of the other elements, you could actually make yourself worse, not better. So in a separate uh, thing, I have talked about vitamin K2 and how that's essential to be aware of on the top of you having D3. Well, I'm kind of want to do something similar here with zinc and iron. So men tend to have a deficiency of zinc and women tend to have a deficiency of iron. This is because women bleed and men ejaculate. Although there isn't much zinc in ejaculate, it's significant and I can't remember exactly what it is, like 0.3 milligrams or something like that compared to a recommended daily amount of 15 milligrams. But we have to understand with all of these things, the recommended amount, you don't absorb most of it. So the amount you absorb is relatively small. We, uh, we talked about that when we talked about D3 and... Um, K2, how, um, you know, the more D3 you have, the more calcium you actually absorb. If you're low in D3, you'll absorb very little calcium. So we don't actually absorb that much of the zinc that we take in. Anyway, so if, if men are ejaculating frequently, they're losing quite a lot of zinc. And then women, if they are bleeding, especially heavily because of some kind of hormonal issue, they're going to be losing a lot of iron. Now, Generally, there's not an issue with excess zinc unless someone is supplementing, but there is actually sometimes an issue of excess iron for men, even if they don't supplement because they don't bleed. Um, the iron builds up more and more and more, and there's something called um, hemochromatosis where um, it's actually a serious life-threatening disease. There is a genetic tendency towards that, um, and I've seen like in the carnival community, people who eat like nonstop animal food, <laughs> they've actually <laughs> caused themselves serious disease by doing that. All men, <laughs> um, by over like creating iron overload. Now, here's the thing about iron and zinc and copper and molybdenum. Every single one of these is bad if you have too little, but it's also bad if you have too much. In the case of um zinc and molybdenum the having too much the main problem is it depletes the others as far as i understand but iron and copper are both seriously bad news if you have excessive amounts they're they actually poison the body um there is this thing called unbound iron so we talked you know in another section about how your body generally transports minerals around bounds to something, usually amino acid. 
And so if you have too much iron and it's unbound iron, it causes havoc and devastation. It is a pro-oxidizing constituent. Like rust in a way, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it is a strong oxidizer. And so while it is an essential nutrient that we definitely do, do not want too little of, it is also kind of a poison if we have too much of it. And so it's really important with iron to have the right amount. Generally, I would say it's good for everyone to test it. The good news of iron is it's really simple and cheap to test it because it is like a mainstream medical thing. And so uh, whether you're a man or a woman, if you're a man, it's worth testing at least occasionally to make sure that you're not overloading it, usually, unless maybe you've had a very strict, you know, vegan diet for a long time or something like that. But generally men don't get at least a serious deficiency in it, but they can get an excess. And for a woman, it's good to check fairly regularly, at least while she's, uh, you know, in her menstruating years to make sure that she hasn't got a serious deficiency. And I think we touched on it with the best test episode, but just to recap quickly here, would they be looking or testing just for iron in the blood, ferritin? What would it be quickly? Usually like it's an iron panel that you can get fairly cheaply and easily, like just with a finger prick test. Um, so there's a few metrics, but I won't go into too much detail. The key thing is ferritin. So you want a, you want a level of ferritin that is not too high or too low. I think like generally 30, between 30 and 100, something like that. Even once it gets over 70 or 80, it's starting to be oxidizing. So you really want it, depending on you know your gender and all that, you really want it like that 50, 70 range is kind of ideal, where you're nowhere near deficiency, but you're not getting to that point that it's starting to cause trouble either. So ferritin, yeah, would be the thing that I go for. But get all the other stuff, the TIBC and the unsaturated iron binding and the hemoglobin, all kinds of stuff. When they test iron, they usually also test um, like for anemia. So they'll be testing your red blood cells as well. Um, copper, when it's excessive, absolutely acts like a poison in the body. Um, I won't go into a huge amount of detail on that, but literally there is a, it's, it's bad enough there's a name for it, just like with iron, and it's called Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is quite interesting because um, it, not only does it make you very sick, it actually turns you into a psychopath. So you can have a normal person who suddenly they have no sense of shame, no sense of guilt, no sense of remorse, no sense of conscience, just through having an overload of copper. Pretty amazing. Um, so it's seriously bad news to have too much of it. You do not want to turn into a, uh, a psychopath of any kind. Um, however, it's essential for hormones. It's essential actually also to prevent anemia. Um, it's essential for um, even coloring pigment of your hair. And, you know, um, it, it's uh, essential for um, the adrenal glands, the adrenal um, uh, neurotransmitters. It's essential for a bunch of stuff, like ev almost everything, just like with magnesium. And yet you want to be really careful. And unlike magnesium, that it's very hard to build up toxic levels of, you absolutely can build up toxic levels of copper and iron. You can build up toxic levels of zinc too. But what I've seen more is that people have a zinc overdose, like they take too much at once, and then it causes nausea and stuff like that. Um, but it is possible to build up zinc excessively they don't generally have a name for it it's just that it will poison you if you have too much molybdenum i've seen like a couple of cases where people overdo it like in the in the literature but it's i think it's happened less than the time that you can count in your hand maybe because not a lot of people are mega dosing molybdenum so let's just talk about what they each do so we talked about iron copper zinc is one of those things like magnesium again it's essential for over 300 enzymatic processes in the body it's often associated with, you know, men, partly because they get depleted in it, but also because it's essential for testosterone. But you know what? It's essential for progesterone as well. It's essential for cortisol. It's essential for, like, all the hormones and neurotransmitters to various degree. It's essential for ATP energy production. It's essential for metabolism. It's essential for hair and skin and nails. There's so many good things about um, zinc. So... And then there's molybdenum. Now, molybdenum is way less broad than all the ones I just said. Usually, the, the main thing that molybdenum is essential for is the sulfur, sulfate, sulfite cycle. So, and so, therefore, molybdenum is often um, seen as a detoxification-supporting mineral. 
a lot of people say, you know, when they're fasting, when they're detoxing, if they take molybdenum, then a lot of their kind of detoxification side effects go away. If that's true, it's because it is helping the body um, take sulfite, which is a very toxic inter intermediate chemical, which is also found in foods as a preservative, a very toxic substance. And it turns it into sulfate, which is a beneficial chemical that helps the detoxification process and isn't toxic. So when you don't have enough molybdenum, you have a buildup of sulfite and you don't have enough sulfate. So even though it's only that one enzyme, again, you're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain. So that can be a weak link that can really screw up your, your whole system and your whole quality of life. So every essential nutrient is essential. That's why it's called essential, <laughs> including molybdenum. But it's, 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 re it's benefit as far as we know is not nearly as broad as the other three. So here's the thing. You might end up with an excess of iron for reasons we talked about. Why would you end up with an excess of copper? Often it's because um, you don't have enough zinc and you're eating high copper foods. Maybe supplementing. but off. So what are high copper foods? In a nutshell, high copper foods tend to be plant foods, whereas high zinc foods tend to be animal foods. There are a few plant foods that are high in zinc and you know, probably the highest source of copper actually is liver, uh, which is an animal food. But still, overall, if you eat like a, a normal vegan diet or a quote unquote normal carnivore, I suppose, without organs, um, if you have a carnivore diet without organs, you'll have too high zinc and iron, nowhere near enough copper. In fact, that's one of the reasons why people often recommend organs these days for people on a carnivore diet, although I'm dubious about the benefits of that for reasons we talked about in another video. Uh, related to uh, vitamin A. Um, and if you're on a plant-based diet, then you tend to have plenty of copper. In fact, too much copper, not enough zinc. And if you're a woman, not enough iron. So that balance is crucial. And that's why, you know, ultimately these days, again, with diet, I maybe I'll want to do a full episode on it soon and we'll talk about that minefield that upsets everyone. Um, but basically... I'm not telling you should be a carnivore or a vegan or whatever. I'm just saying if you are those things, especially if you're on extreme end either way, be aware of the consequences of that in regards to this and supplement or change your diet to make up for it. But if you don't want to change your diet, fine. Supplement to make up for it. Um, or, yeah, I suppose with a carnivore, you can do it with organs. But again, I would prefer not to do it. Okay. Um, and then molybdenum is something that is not high in that many foods. It's mainly high in beans. A lot of people don't want to eat beans. So again, do you need to worry about molybdenum if you're just eating a normal diet? Eh, probably not. But if you are if you start supplementing high-dose zinc, or if you start supplementing iron, or even if you start supplementing copper, suddenly you maybe you do want to be aware of it. You do want to be familiar with it and you want to make sure that it's included in whatever multi you have or you want to have it, you know, periodically or you want to test for it to see if that's an issue. Um, so, yeah, it's it's finding the right balance of those things for you. It's always better to test, if you can, what your levels are of all these things, as we talked about, as you said, in the best test episode, Chrissy. But so, you know, I wanted to talk about you know, overlooked and underrated. I guess the thing that to me is overlooked and underrated about these four is having them in balance. <laughs> That's really the key thing as opposed to overemphasizing one or two and as a result creating a, you know, a serious deficiency in something else. I mean, until we started uh, talking and doing this po podcast, I'd never heard of molybdenum. <laughs> I can't even say it properly. So it's just like all of those things. Yes, I hear iron, iron, iron. I've got my own issues with iron that I'm still, you know, working on. But, um, you know, understanding that there is this balance, that there is this, I don't know if you would call it a homeostasis or, but this relationship essentially. And that, that, mm -hmm. that needs attention, you know, which is imperative to you know feeling younger and making sure that the the body system has everything in its capacity to operate optimally which is essentially what we're really trying to you know promote here yeah and again you know it's funny that i always like to disagree sorry i always like to agree with the people who disagree with me and one way i disagree is like oh you shouldn't be eating supplements you should just have a natural diet i would say the argument i've just made in this is kind of supporting them because basically if you eat 
quote unquote natural diet as in like a normal diet of some animal food some plant food and you're overall you know generally healthy you might you probably actually be okay at least for those four although you might do with optimizing it it's when we have the crazy extreme diets of none of this or none of that or when we have like the big supplements of this or that often that we create a problem with these four so you know maybe your grandparents who never took any supplements and just ate like a, a traditional diet whatever that was they were actually less likely than you to have these problems because you know you're trying to be healthy or i'm trying to be healthy you're taking like big doses of zinc because you hear it's good for you and then it, it creates a different issue yeah and so then what would be or maybe the you know if it just in general like the best forms in the doses or is there at this stage with these four so they're all minerals and so the best most well absorbed form is always the amino acid silates so you can um this is especially important for like the cheapest forms of zinc are like zinc sulfate if you have like even a recommended daily amount of zinc sulfate like 15 milligrams it can make you nauseous it's really not good so especially with zinc if you want to supplement it um you want to have the amino acid chelated version um Although, yeah, zinc citrate is okay and zinc oxide won't do any harm. It's just not as well absorbed. Um, with copper, same thing. And to be honest, it usually is bound to amino acid copper when I see it sold as a supplement. Um, molybdenum can be either. Sometimes it's sold as citrate, but usually, uh, I can't remember. I think, is it glycinate? It might be bound to glycine usually. Um, so those would be the best forms to have. Iron is the trickiest by far. For some reason, um, certainly like the the uh, the iron that they often give you, the cheap iron that unfortunately often like a doctor recommends, um, like a ferrous gluconate or something like that, the iron bound to something uh, inorganic, it is poorly absorbed and it often causes constipation and... Um, is not good even the amino acid silated ones though it's the only mineral this is the case for are sometimes not well absorbed and the people in that case often need heme iron they need the actual type of iron that is found in the bodies of other animals <laughs> i don't know how to put it the, the the you know specifically the blood of other animals so this is where some people it's not the majority but they they go vegan, even vegetarian, and even, they even supplement iron, and they still end up with iron deficiency. Um, I've known those people. I've, I used to argue with them when I was a vegan, raw vegan, God knows how long ago, over a decade ago. Not argue, but, you know, like questioning them because I couldn't believe what they were saying was true, but it absolutely is true. Like there are certain people that just need heme iron. And so it's one of the only things where I tell people that supplement may not do it you may have to have a food source for it to really work however if you don't want to hear that there is um like an iron polypeptide which seems to be well absorbed so rather than just being bound to an amino acid it's actually bound to a peptide uh, which is a string of amino acids several amino acids in a row i haven't heard this explanation but my theory as to why it's better absorbed is because it's even closer to how it would be naturally because usually your body will bind these things to not just one amino acid, but to a peptide. So it seems to be a way that your body recognizes and is able to absorb the most easily. There are some people that are selling heme iron as a supplement as well that comes from dry blood. That's still not going to be good enough to a vegan, but that's an option if you just don't like the taste of meat and animal foods, but you're not ethically against it. Um, you know, some people talk about molasses. Molasses is like a good plant source of uh, reasonably well um you know absorbed iron but again molasses is basically sugar with a bunch of minerals you'd have to have a hell of a lot of it to reverse like a low ferritin level so it's kind of an excuse having a massive amount of sugar um <laughs> which may not be beneficial so iron is the trickiest one to get a form that actually works definitely no without any doubt of any nutrient pretty much and then within this um scope you know what are the safety concerns or would there be any other kind of contraindications other than anything that you might have already mentioned as far as the relationship between the four with this you know it's best to test with these um are, 
Iron is something that I would actually not recommend people have more than the RDA of for you know, their type. It is higher for women than men without blood tests that show that they need it. With the copper, I think the RDA used to be two milligram and now it's been downgraded to only one milligram. I feel pretty confident recommending like two milligram a day to most people. But again, that's in total, including from food. And so um, if you eat a lot of plant foods, uh, especially like nuts and seeds and stuff, you probably don't need any supplement copper. Oh, and certainly not if you have liver or, you know, one of these things that's really high in copper. Um, that's something, again, with copper, usually where I prefer to see a test results to show that you actually need it because, as we talked about, too much is a real issue. With zinc, the recommended amount is usually about 15 milligrams, very similar to iron. And a lot of people are taking a lot more than that, taking like 50 milligrams. We talked about why that may not be a good idea, right? Because it's then depleting the other ones. I, I feel like 20, 25 milligrams is probably a good maximum. If your immune system is really struggling, I would not go to 50 as so many people do without knowing that you actually need that much. Um, 20 milligrams is probably a good amount. Again, this includes from food. Now, if you're not eating animal foods, you're probably not getting very much zinc. So you could just you could <laughs> assume that's all from supplementation. Um, I think the highest plant source of pumpkin seeds, and even there, you have to eat like so many calories of pumpkin seeds to get enough zinc. So it is very difficult to get it from um, purely plant foods. Um, just like it's difficult to get copper from animal foods without organs. Um, and then molybdenum, that's the one I'd be the most liberal with. Like. If you have a lot of it, it can, you know, they actually use molybdenum as a way of addressing copper toxicity. Like that's how effective it is of getting copper out. Like Wilson's disease, they'll give you IV molybdenum. That's one of the ways that they get it out of you. Um, so you don't want high dose molybdenum if you know your copper is low. But if you suspect that it's high because you eat a lot of plant foods and not much animal foods, or, or if you know that it's high, you can go quite high of molybdenum. But other than that, I think the recommended daily amount is 50, 70 milligrams, something like that. Sorry, micrograms, 50, 70 micrograms, something like that. I would say 200 micrograms is safe. That's not going to deplete a significant amount of copper unless you suspect or know that your copper is low. 